The Acts of the Apostles chronicles the spread of the church. But to understand what's happening in these last few days, we've got to go back to some of the first. For in the book of Genesis, God made Adam and Eve in his image, so they might dwell with him, dine with him, and take the light of his visage to every corner of creation they could possibly roam. Adam and Eve did not end up spreading God's image. Instead, they spread their own. But God would not leave his creation alone. So he died for their sins and rose from the grave. But before he ascended back to his heavenly place, he told his disciples what would be the scope of their work. They would take the news of what Jesus had earned to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. But something else had to happen first. So the Holy Spirit came to each of them like a flame, so they could fulfill an old mission, but in a new way to spread God's church to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and then the ends of the earth. Now, in the book of Acts, this threefold project serves as a table of contents. Part one, the gospel goes to Jerusalem, where Peter and the disciples begin the gospel's distribution. Part two, the gospel expands to Judea and Samaria, where Philip and others bring Israel's divided kingdom back under God's united rule over the area. Part three, the gospel goes to the ends of the earth as Paul and his fellow workers plant church after church. And in every place the disciples reached, the gospel of Jesus was boldly preached. Whether it was Peter's Pentecost sermon or his plea before the rulers, whether it was Stephen's testimony and martyrdom or Philip being the Ethiopian's tutor, whether it was to God-fearing Gentiles or in pagan Greek rings, whether it was Paul in every synagogue or before every king. But something else happened in all three of the regions the disciples would visit. When the gospel was preached and the people would hear it, the event was marked off by an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For Jerusalem, the Spirit came at Pentecost to show that the power who raised Jesus from the dead is now with us. For Judea and Samaria, the Spirit came through the preaching of the gospel and the laying on of hands to show that those who seemed to have worked themselves out of God's grace were still within God's plan. And when the Spirit poured out on the house of the Gentile Cornelius, God was showing that this good news was not just for one group, but was for all of us. For that is the reason God told the disciples to go, to leave Jerusalem, so the whole earth might become the new Garden of Eden. And now, the Acts of the Apostles continues with us, the church, so may we take the good news of Jesus to our neighbors and to the nations until the light of Jesus fills the ends of the earth. Welcome, Willowdale Baptist Church. We just celebrated the greatest, the most significant event in the history of mankind the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Literally, everything hangs in the balance if this is not true. The Lord Jesus himself on the cross of Calvary said, It is finished. What was finished? Full payment was made to the just God of all creation for the sins of of mankind. All sins? Yes, all. One pure and holy sacrifice was given by the only one who ever lived without sin. Jesus Christ tempted in all ways like you and me, but without sin. In Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, 
we read this. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we pro profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus gave himself for you and for me. We know that the sacrifice was sufficient to eliminate my debt, your debt, the world's debts, because it was accepted by God the Father. The proof that we have that this actually took place is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Because of the resurrection, we have what is called the book of Acts. We're just about to begin a new sermon series in the book of Acts. It's also known as the Acts of the Apostle. This book is the second installment or the continuation of the account of what Jesus Christ began to do and teach. Luke, the author, has written once again to Theophilus. And Theophilus actually means friend of God. The first installment we know as the Gospel of Luke. I encourage all of you to read the four Gospels and then continue with the book of Acts. They are all interconnected. The book of Acts is all about new beginnings. Sin is forgiven. The slate is wiped clean. We are given a new chance to start over. Death is conquered once and for all. Eternal life has been made available to all who believe. The Holy Spirit is given so that we are not left alone and now can understand what God is saying to us through His Word. The Spirit also enables us or empowers us to obey God's instructions. The church is born and God's mission is clearly and openly given not only to the Jews, but now also to the Gentiles. The work of the Son on earth is finished and now is the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit. I might suggest that another title for this book would be Acts of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is quite the focus of this book. The book of Acts is God's account of his missionary plans. This book confirms in multiple ways the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the ultimate resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It goes on to outline the coming of the Holy Spirit, the beginning of the church, how the new covenant is lived out through his church, including you and me, and the expansion of God's kingdom to all nations. Dr. Rice, is, in his extensive commentary on the books of Acts, puts it this way. The book of Acts is divided into two distinct parts. Chapter 1 to 12, Peter is the main character, and Jerusalem is the center, and the gospel is to the Jews. Chapter 13 to 28, Paul is the principal character. Antioch is the center of the missionary work, 
And the gospel is preached to the Gentiles more than to the Jews. He goes on to outline the Great Commission that we find in Acts 1.8. Every missionary knows this, and I'm sure you know this passage well. Acts 1.8, where we read, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The gospel is powerful, and God has filled men and women with power by the Holy Spirit to enable them to take this good news everywhere. Following the growth of the gospel and the progression from Jerusalem and Judea, we find in chapter 1 through chapter 6 of Acts, we see it moving from there to uh, Galilee and Samaria, starting in chapter 6, beginning in verse 8, all the way to 9, verse 31. Also moves on to Antioch, which became the launching pad to the world. And that's found in chapter 9, verse 32 to 12, 24. But it goes even further to Asia. Chapter 12, beginning in verse 25, continuing to chapter 16, verse 5. And then to Europe. Chapter 16, verse 6 to 19, verse 20. And ultimately to Rome. The center of the universe at that point of time, or at least of the, of the powers that ruled the earth. And we find that... Um, in Acts chapter 19, verse 21, to, to chapter 28, verse 31. Barclay, another New Testament scholar, has said, said it this way. The title of Acts might be, How they brought the good news from Jerusalem to Rome. Another Bible commentator has put it this way, David Guzak. And he says, Wonderfully, what Jesus began still continues. This is a real sense in which the book of Acts continues to be written today. Not in an authoritative, authoritative scriptural sense, but in the sense of God's continued work in the world by His Spirit and through his church. So from this brief introduction into this marvelous book of Acts, what can we learn? How is God's will and his plans fulfilled? Let us follow the example of the disciples by taking a deeper look, utilizing a simple but profound method to engage the scriptures. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we read, Acts 2, 42, They devoted themselves, who's the they? The disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And just a few verses uh, um, continuing in Acts 2, verse 46, we read, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together, together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what did they do? They examined the scripture. They had fellowship. They broke bread and prayed every day. Many of you 
know that I'm a full-time missionary with Fellowship International. And a number of years ago, they embraced um, a very old methodology, which is called Discovery Bible Study or Discovery Groups. And the Fellowship Baptist Churches here in Canada are embracing this model that has been very effective over overseas. All of us together are seeking to grow deeper in our relationship with God and help others to do the same. Discovery Bible study is a very simple thing. Many of you have already heard me speak of this on a number of occasions, or you have observed me if you've been in any meeting that I've, that I've had the privilege of leading. I've always utilized this message, method. But simply put, what is a Discovery Bible Study, also known as by the acronym DBS? A Discovery Bible Study is a discipleship study which enables people to read the Bible and discover what it has to say to them. Simple, memorable questions allow participants to understand the character of God and also encourages them to obey what they're learning and help others to share with others. Very, very simple um, method that can be applied to any scriptural passages. What's the, the process or what's the procedure? What you do is you begin by praying, asking God to enlighten us and help us as we read his word so that we will have understanding. Then you read the passage, whatever passage of scripture that has been chosen to study together. And you read that passage in two or three different translations. After you've done that, spend a bit of time reading it over again yourself, and then you ask someone to put it into their own words and to summarize what they've just read. After we've done that, four simple questions are, are, are asked. From this passage of Scripture, and only from that passage of Scripture, we ask the question, what does this scripture or this story tell us about God? The second question is, what does this story tell me about people? Or tell, tell me about myself? That's the second question. The third question is, if this is God's word for my life, how will I obey it? And the fourth question is, who am I going to tell about this? Very simple questions, very simple way to engage in the scriptures. And you don't need any other materials. You don't need manuals. You don't need encyclopedias. Just the word of God. And you ask these simple questions to it. And ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us so that he will direct our paths. At the end of the, of the, the time together, uh, we encourage each other to write down three I wills. And what are those I wills? Those are things to practice or to put into obedience. For example, I will spend five minutes a day in prayer or I will share this with my neighbor John. Whatever. Those three I will statements are tangible things that can be um, checked up on. And the next time that you get together, you ask each other, so how did it go? Have you been able to implement these, these things that you learned from last week, this week? Were you able to go and share, tell somebody about what you have learned in the Word of God? I have found this personally very invigorating and very useful and have been able to apply it regularly with some of my neighbors, one fellow that I go with uh, on walks with, other people that I meet uh, by chance. I share with them the things that God is telling me in my own devotional time as I'm, as I'm doing this. But this practice is wonderful if you join together three, four, or five uh, people to work through this together. The elders have been praying about all of this, and so have you. So now is the time to implement what we believe that God has called us to do 
at Willowdale Baptist Church. Our vision is, by prayer, on God's mission, loving the community. It was with a heavy heart that um, we had to cancel last Sunday. I was so looking forward to Easter Sunday where we were going to gather together for the first time in quite a while. We were going to have baptism. We were going to have, a, um, have communion together. And I was sad that because of the situation with COVID, we were not able to gather together in, in person. But should these things stop us? Is the gospel not as powerful today as it was when it was first proclaimed? Yes, of course it is. It's still powerful. And the Holy Spirit still wants to empower us and enable you and me to go forth and share that good news. I was actually going to start today, um, the beginning of our, our study in Acts, by doing a brief Discovery Bible study in the first eight verses of Acts. But since Pastor Joel will be starting chapter one of Acts next week, I, God led me to another passage which clearly emphasizes prayer. And I encourage you, I challenge you, I believe that God wants us to do, to practice extraordinary prayer. And what was the passage that he brought to mind to me? Some of you will recognize it immediately. Second Chronicles chapter 7 verse 11 to 16. Throughout this week as, I, as I've been praying, God's been laying on, on my heart. Should we call everybody who gathers or congregates through Willowdale Baptist Church to fast and to pray and to start today to do this. So what we're going to do is I will read um, um, Second Chronicles in two different um, translations and then we will be uh, dividing up into uh, small groups you can use the DBS materials or you can just ask God to lay on your heart what he wants to accomplish in these days. This is the word of God that we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse 11 to 16. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens, so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and will seek my face, and will turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. 2 Chronicles 7, 11 to 16. Some of you might even, even see how this connects to the book of Nehemiah that we just finished because uh, the first part, when Solomon finished the temple, God speaks to him in this. 
I will read uh, the same passage I just read in another uh, more modern uh, uh, version. And this is 2 Chronicles 7, 11 to 16 in the message. Solomon completed the temple of God and the royal palace, the projects he had set his heart on doing. Everything was done. Success, satisfaction. God appeared to Solomon that very night and said, I accept your prayers. Yes, I have chosen this place as a temple for sacrifice, a house of worship. If I ever shut off the supply of rain from the skies or order the locusts to eat the crops or send a plague on my people and my people, my God defined people respond by humbling themselves, praying, seeking my presence and turning their backs on their wicked lives. I will be there ready for you. I'll listen from heaven, forgive their sins and restore their land to health. From now on, I'm alert day and night to the prayers offered in this place. Believe me, I have chosen and sanctified this temple that you have built. My name is stamped on it forever. My eyes are on it and my heart is in it always. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to divide up as we have done on other Sundays. Uh, we've had time together in smaller groups to meet and greet each other. And today we're going to start by having small groups to pray, to intercede for our nation, for our country. Plague is impacting us, not only here in Canada, but around the world. We need to pray, asking God to intervene. There will be a number of, of suggestions, things to be praying for, praying for our rulers and authorities over, over us, for healthcare people, first line workers, there are many people that God wants us to be praying for, to intercede for, that he would give them wisdom, give insight, and a way to deal with this current pandemic that we find ourselves in. As we go to prayer, the desire of the, of the elders of the church is that these small groups may continue. So if you would like to continue on a regular basis praying together in these groups, we hope that that will come about. We also are praying that a um, number of small groups, these Discovery Bible Studies, will be established as well. It doesn't need to be many people, just a small group of people gathered around the Word of God seeking His direction for our lives. Let me close in a word of prayer as before you, you go off into the, the small groups. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you that we had the opportunity last week um, to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, each and every one of us is here today because the resurrection is a fact. It's true. You have given us new life and new hope and new purpose. Father, we live in very difficult and trying times. Many getting discouraged and many even dying. Father, do not allow us to um, waste opportunities that you are providing to share the hope, the love of Jesus Christ, the salvation, the eternal life that is found in Christ alone. Father, humble our, our hearts. Convict us of sin so that we might confess these things to you, that we might come to you and that you would hear our prayer, interceding for all those around us. We just thank you for the privilege we have of collaborating with your Holy Spirit. Guide us and direct us as your people, Lord. For we pray all of these things in the strong and powerful name 
of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.